If the natural tendencies of mankind are so bad that it is not safe to permit people to be free, how is it that the tendencies of these organizers are always good? Do the legislators and their appointed agents also belong to the human race, or do they believe they themselves are made of a finer clay than the rest of mankind? Welcome to Keith Knight, Don't Tread on Anyone. Today we'll be discussing uh, Crimes Against Logic by Jamie White. He is a past lecturer of philosophy at Cambridge University and winner of Analysis Journalist Prestige Prize for the best article by a philosopher under 30. Mr. White, thank you for coming on. Your, my pleasure. As you can see, that I won that prize quite a while ago. Yeah. Uh, what is fake news? Ah. Well, fake news is it's, uh, stories that are presented as news that are false. Um, and there's plenty of it. Uh, I'll just a little anecdote, actually. I, I, I worked in politics for a while. I was the leader of a minor political party in New Zealand just for one year, um, because I, I lost the election. But in other, that got me into the news a fair bit. And then there have been other occasions in my life where I've either been in a news story or close, close to a news story. And on most occasions, there were material errors in the, in the reporting. And I, it occurred to me, you know, I'm in a position to know the facts in these stories, and I can see that they're getting them wrong in reasonably important ways. And so if that's happening in, you know, let's say 80% of the cases where I know facts, it's probably happening just all the time. So, and by the way, it wasn't on the whole uh, malice on the part of the journalists. Uh, sometimes it was, certainly it was. There were sometimes occasions, especially when I was in politics, where politicians, uh, reporters who didn't like my views would, would do everything they could to distort what I said, make me seem evil and so on. But, but more often, they were just kind of incompetence, actually. So I think that if you're a grown-up person, you should expect there to be a lot of error in the news and you should you know, take it with a grain of salt, as they say. But, and that's always been known. Um, my father told me this when I was a boy, you know, you shouldn't believe everything you read in the newspapers. I think it's, it's been common knowledge, ordinary wisdom for forever. Um, but the idea of fake news has taken off. And I think that, you know, in, in some, people's hands, or almost everyone's hands, who uses the term, it's, it's to suggest a conspiracy of some kind. And, some, and, and also to suggest a response. And that, that response is that the authorities should control the media in some way. You know, the, so what can be heard, what can be said, you know, this, will all be, um, this will all be managed by the authorities. You know, in, to to a greater or lesser extent, we'll have something like the Ministry of Truth. And that's why I'm very opposed to the hysteria about uh, fake news. I, I say just look, be a grown up, learn to live with it, you know, learn how to check sources, look at more than one source, try to work out which sources are reliable, which sources are not, just, you know, do the normal work of a responsible adult. Um, don't try and hand it over to some, give somebody power over you. Um, to protect you, because you know what they're going to do with it. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's really amazing. People will actually say things like, uh, but, but my opening quote was from 1850, an economist, Frederick Bastiat, who was basically saying, you know, you're always criticizing people and how you're pessimistic and you don't trust people, but you want this group of people to have much more power than anyone else. So it's not that I'm naive and you're living in the real world. It's just, uh, it's more or less uh, different playing fields where we could either have a monopoly on truth or we could have competing truth. It's not like, uh, should things be true or should they be false? Well, of course, we all want them to be, um, to be true. It's uh, just a mechanism of determining truth from falsehood. Do you see a lot of overlap in your advocacy for uh, free market ideas and this opposition to fake news, for example? Shouldn't the state just uh, monopolize education and healthcare and well, utilities? And for the same reason, they shouldn't monopolize, you know, news? Well, it's the same 
actually you, when you were giving the kind of the argument uh, regarding speech, it occurred to me that exactly the same argument is often used uh, on these other matters. So for example, if you say, in, in Great Britain here, we have this thing called the National Health Service. It's the government monopoly, basically, in the supply of health care. I mean, you can have private alternatives, but since you get taxed to pay for the NHS, um, and it's offered free after the tax is paid, well, then, you know, the, it crowds out the private sector. Now, one of the things that, one of the interesting kind of rhetorical ploys is that if you criticize the NHS, if you say this is a dreadful arrangement, you're presented as not caring about health care. As if, you know, if, if you were to say the government, or if you say the government shouldn't regulate uh, education, education should just be a completely free market, like anything else, you have private suppliers offering a service to consumers that they may or may not want, and it shouldn't be regulated by the state, certainly shouldn't be supplied by the state, shouldn't even be regulated by the state. They say, oh, you don't care about standards in education. As if somehow the only source of standards could be the state. I mean... The, the obvious source of standards is consumers. Consumers don't want shoddy goods, right? And the problem when you move to a, and you don't, you're not, you're going to go out of business if you don't provide them with something they want. The, the, so the rhetoric's the reverse of the truth. The truth is that when the state gets involved, they can impose any old standards they want, whether consumers want things that way or not. Also, they tend to supply a one-size-fits-all kind of, you know, a single standard, where what you want on the whole are a variety of standards that you can choose between that compete. But one thing that's not sufficiently well understood, I think, about markets, even by some people who are pro-markets, is it's not just competition between goods and services, suppliers of goods and services. There's competition between suppliers of rules, of standards. Uh, for example, a share market. You know, they have any stock market will have rules for what you have to disclose as a business if your shares are going to be listed on that stock market. That's a kind of system of rules. Now, the government comes along and regulates that stuff as well. They don't really need to. The stock markets could do it for themselves. And then we would have competition between stock markets and it would be, uh, would get higher standards and we get more variety. You might have one stock market that suits certain kinds of firms, large ones maybe, other markets that suit different ones. And we do see a bit of that already. But insofar as the government gets involved, they impede that kind of process. But to your point, yeah, I mean, I think as you get older, uh, the point about that these are people, right, who are doing these things. Uh, Mike Munger is very good about this. Never say the government. Say, name the people who are making the decision. The government doesn't do anything, right? That guy does it. Joe Biden does it. Now, is Joe Biden a lot smarter than me? Is Joe Biden able to make better decisions for me than I can make for myself. As I say, as you get older, the mystique of the government vanishes because some of the guys you went to school with are big wigs in politics or something. Yeah, that guy, that guy, I mean, you know, he couldn't run a bath, uh, let alone a country, you know. So that, that's, uh, that's one of the few compensations of getting older. You, you see through these, these characters. Now, one thing about market competition that I was introduced to by Jason Brennan, a philosopher at Georgetown yeah, University, I, I know, yeah. he said, uh, it's not just competition, it's really competition to cooperate. In other words, in America, we have two similar stores, Home Depot and Lowe's. These are uh, home appliance where you'd buy wood and tools and all this uh, mm -hmm. wide range, wide variety of things. And yes, they are competing with each other, trying to get customers, trying to get employees and CEOs. But in order to compete, they first have to uh, cooperate with all the people who make the metal, all the people who make the building, all the customers. They have to compete with the employees, compete uh, cooperate with all the contractors. To compete, you first have to cooperate with millions of people. The idea is that Adam Smith was talking about 250 uh, years ago. What are some other things about uh, competition and cooperation that go unappreciated in the free market discussions? Um, well, I mean, one point about, if you're going to be participate in a market, um, you have to cooperate not just with your suppliers and your customers, but to some extent with your competitors. 
So it's, I mean, not too much. If you get together, like Adam Smith said, and cooperate in price fixing and so on, uh, you're, you're harming your customers. I don't think that needs to be regulated uh, because I, it can't be sustained on the whole. Someone will break ranks um, to get a better deal. It's very difficult to sustain cartels. But but there is a sense in which you cooperate. Even, even the competitors co cooperate, which is that, and this is going to kind of a, a diff, another level in a sense of what it means to cooperate. They participate in a framework of behavior that is inherently civilized. You, you, the, the market economy requires people to, you know, it requires peace. We all know that. So you, you don't want to, you don't want to actually go around. I don't know, the management of, I don't know, Home Depot. I remember what's the other one you said? Um, Lowe's. Lowe's. You know, they're not going to drive around in a pickup truck with a machine gun mounted on the back and shoot up Lowe's, right? Uh, hmm. Stuff like that does go on in places in the world. And, but you know, when you get to a, a, a stable and advanced uh, market economy, the participants in it tend to understand quite well that it benefits everybody. And you have high degrees of um, broad cooperation with the system, so to speak. I, I don't like talking about the system, but I, I mean, you know, certain conventions of honesty and openness and uh, peacefulness. People, people go along with them because they see that it's in their benefit. David Hume wrote quite a lot about this, and this being the foundation of, um, of modern, peaceful, orderly societies. You only need a small amount of power at work. I, you know, it, it could be private, it could be the police, you know, by the state, it could be private guards, something, but you don't need much if the system is, you know, operating pretty well, because people cooperate in, main, in the maintenance of the order that facilitates it. And what, again, one of the things that left wing is often socialists say is that capitalism makes people bad, it makes them greedy, it makes them selfish, it makes them cruel and heartless and so on. Actually, it's, that's the opposite of the truth. Capitalism promotes a bunch of virtues, such as being trustworthy, being, um, being open to strangers, you know, because you want to do business with them. Um, it's kind of the, the opposite of tribalism. It, it's cosmopolitan and, and civilized. So, um, you know, you never, none of, no non-market economies have ever been lovely places to live. Now, uh, when people hear uh, capitalism, they will often assume that this is uh, very few people either get, getting all the money in society, controlling the rest of us, or sometimes working with the state in order to get a monopoly. For example, in 1913 in America, uh, Woodrow Wilson, the president, signed the Federal Reserve Act, which just gave a monopoly on money printing to the mm. Federal Reserve Bank which is just a private bank of people with the name federal. What does it mean to support free market capitalism? This is, I think, a very tricky topic. Um, a lot of the anti-capitalist feel sentiment that we now see was stirred up by the financial crisis of 2008. I think that if banks hadn't been bailed out by governments, and um, it, it depends, if there'd been very there's been very severe economic shock. People might have developed anti-capitalist feelings anyway. But the bailouts made people think that capitalism is a kind of a rigged system. You know, uh, if you do well, you get the profits. If you do badly, the losses are spread across the whole of society through taxation. Um, and I've got some sympathy with that view. Now, I don't think that's, that's not the kind of, that's, that's a bastardization of capitalism, that's so-called crony capitalism. Um, some people would say it's not capitalism at all. Um, I, think, I think there are two elements in capitalism. Um, if you, one is the private ownership of the means of production. And you can have that without having free markets, which is the other important element. Um, so in, in uh, the fascist regime of the 1930s, you had private ownership of the means of production, but the government directed the use of that, of that capital. And you had to be in with the government if you were gonna get ahead, right? So you had one element of capitalism, but not the, the, not the free market element. Most of us who are fans of capitalism are very fond of the free market side. But so I could just say, oh, well, that's not proper capitalism. I don't like that. But I think there's a more serious problem here, which is that 
there's an interaction between capitalism and democracy, which can be problematic. So in capitalism, in a free market capitalist system, it's almost impossible to avoid large accumulations of wealth, either in corporations or some individuals. Right? And then, you know, then that they will naturally seek advantage through the political system. They'll lobby politicians to get tariffs put on imports from their foreign competitors, to create regulatory barriers to new competition domestically. You know, you see, and you even see it with professionals. You get these professional organizations who lobby politicians to have you know, license, professional licensing and all that kind of thing, which just restricts competition and harms, um, harms consumers. It's a really difficult problem. How do you stop that? Right? Um, some people say, you know, there should be limits on how much money can be spent uh, in political campaigning, and that would help to look, stop it. You know, lobbyists should be registered, or, you know, all sorts of things, right? all sorts of attempts to constrain it. I don't know. I, I must say, I don't know what the right answer is. Um, I think part of the answer is just gutting politics. So um, that's to say, the, 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 if there weren't, the, the, a, there are a lot of people, in the, Tyler Cowen and some people who are apparently libertarians have talked about state capacity. They, they want the state to be, they want a good state. Well, I don't really. I want a gutted state. I want one that can't do anything. Um, they're useless. There's no point lobbying them because they've got very little power. Um, that, that's, and also, I, want, I don't want Parliament to sit. Parliament in Britain sits all the time and they pass all these laws. Well, I don't think, I've been thinking for years, how do you stop the bastards from passing laws all the time, making new laws? Well, just don't allow them to go into Parliament. Just they only sit in Parliament, let's say, one week a year. So they've got to decide. They're going to do just a couple of things. I mean, the idea that the United Kingdom, after 200 years of parliamentary government more, is still passing crime laws is astounding. What, we don't know what the crimes are yet. Uh, we're gonna, it's, it's, it's just stop, for God's sake. But they can't stop. Right? Their job depends on not stopping. So I, would, I think, but, but as I say, that, that, that interaction between money and politics um, is a problem that arises in, demo in countries that are democratic, well, capitalist countries. Uh, and I don't know what the answer is. I mean, one thing to point out is that we libertarians and pro-capitalist people should not be utopian. I, I, the world, a world of humans and scarcity, which are, it's always going to be, unless we get to transhumanism, but let's suppose we're stuck with being humans and we're always going to have scarce, scarce resources, time being the most obvious example. Life's going to be imperfect. The, the question is, which is the best arrangement socially? And even with the problems that capitalism has in this regard, you know, the, the, the attempts to capture politicians, it still massively outperforms any alternative. Still, we still have far better lives much more prosperity, much more liberty. So this is an imperfection for sure, and I'd like to see the back of it, but, but I'd much rather live with that, uh, like in the, in the United States of say 10 years ago, than, than the alternatives suggested by radicals on the left and right. Sure. Uh, e even ideas of, uh, you know, cap large capital accumulation and large wealth, that still is not a uh, free market criticism necessarily. If you, look at, it, it, if you look at King Leopold, or if you look at uh, many monarchs throughout the past, they, alar they amassed large amounts of wealth, but they didn't do it through voluntary exchange yeah. or the homesteading principle, which libertarians explicitly have uh, been on the side of. Uh, differentiating the principal difference between just control, me making the rules mm -hmm. for my house, and me making the rules for Africa. It's, it's contracting with people and uh, right. private property. The, the alternatives, I should have said this, yes, you're, you're quite right. The, the alternative arrangements, rather than viewing this nexus of, of money and political power as problematic and something has to be got rid of, simply build it in. So, you know, in, under a monarchical kind of system, You've got these people who were descended from uh, warlords, effectively, who control masses of capital and can push people around. And they, they do it just directly, right? Uh, under a communist system, all the capital in the country is controlled by the state. 
and some people get to the top of the greasy pole and then they you know deploy it for their benefit so yes the the other systems also have i mean you actually kind of need uh, a great accumulation of capital in, in an advanced economy right because you know think of a, think of a nuclear power station right there's a lot of capital tied up now that's billions and and so you, we can't have completely fra you can have fragmented ownership but you do have to have some aggregations of, of the capital and then somebody's going to control it at least at any point in time and do you want it to be controlled in a market kind of a way where people can buy and sell the shares in it and all that kind of thing the normal stuff that we, or do you want the politicians to control it or kings to control it well yeah i have so i plump for the the fragmented ownership model the transferable ownership model and the model that's responsive to prices because they you know you've got none of that stuff in, in the alternative systems and you get m much uh, much worse decisions made much more oppression yeah. so yes you're right i was being too soft on the alternatives now if i am someone who simply cares about the poor and the downtrodden i want people to have both opportunities and security when it comes to food housing clothing shelter uh why should someone like this uh, embrace the ideas of free markets well, the, the most obvious answer is that there can be no security without prosperity. Um, so you, if you, you know, if we're all, you, you take people in North Korea, they have an, in theory, egalitarian kind of system. And yet some, they often starve to death um, when the harvests fail because the country is just so poor. I mean, even if you've got rid of the, the theft by the Kim family, um, you'd probably still be a very poor country. So you need a certain level of, um, you just need prosperity to feel any security. And the only system that has ever made the poor anything but literally dirt poor is, is capitalism. There's a wonderful chart, you will have seen it, of GDP per person in the United Kingdom, pretty same, much the same. The United Kingdom's the best one because you can track it way, way back. There's, there's some economists have estimated it back to about 800 AD. And basically, it's around about 800 US dollars a year for a British person average. And it, it ticks along pretty flat. So it edges, edges up a little after about 1,200, it's edging up. By around 1,800, it's at about 2,000 uh, 2, US dollars a year. Britain at that point is the richest country in the world. That, by the way, you know, that, that is what? That's... Uh, a little over five dollars a day which is now poverty one of the poverty lines anyway then the chart just goes it's just extraordinary it's just a hockey stick it just goes, shoots it almost goes straight up right the economic progress over the last 200 years built basically on innovation stimulated by the capitalist system um has been astounding unknown in all of history uh, uh, you, uh the increase in incomes of the average Brit has been about, it's been about 20 fold over the last 200 years. So there's no security without that prosperity that's been delivered. Um, the other thing, you know, if you've got a, a flexible labor market, so, you know, it's very, it tends to be very easy to find work. You know, in countries, we've got an exceptional situation right now, but, you know, I've lived, I know the United Kingdom, New Zealand, my native New Zealand, well, and they both have reasonably flexible labor markets, reasonably light regulation of it, not as light as the United States. But interestingly, if you look at countries with that kind of labor market, there's very low rates of unemployment on the whole, involuntary unemployment. And again, you want to be at the best source of security to you is to be able to get a job, a paying job. I mean, you know, people may say, oh, I want, I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to have a kind of social welfare safety net. Uh, well, maybe you would, but the in, you know in countries like France they have ten percent persistent unemployment, and a lot of people though they're fed, it's not a very dignified way of life, and they become extremely despondent. Um, and I'd much rather live in a place where I had a good chance of getting a job if I really wanted to work. Maybe not a great job, but a job. You know, I earn my own money at the end of the day. I have my self-respect, and that's that's I think the best source. I will say one thing. I think there's an argument. It's complicated. I'll try and run it quickly. There's a libertarian kind of an argument for uh, a kind of 
social welfare. Now, let me give it to you. I got it from Stephen Landsberg, but it's a kind of a, it's a, it's a variation of a, of the John Rawls kind of approach to things, but it's not, it's not Rawlsian except in one regard. So he said, says, imagine you, you know, you're going to be born. You're, you're not born yet. You're a kind of soul floating around. You're going to be born. And, but you don't know the circumstances of your birth. You don't know whether you're going to have nice parents or nasty parents. You don't know if you're going to be smart or dumb or maybe you're going to be physically disabled or something like that, right? So you, might, you would, as, as a pre-birth soul, you might want to buy a bad birth insurance. But you can't, right? Because, you know, you can't do anything before you're born and there's no market serving the unborn. And so, and, and the way, but what would happen if you did buy it is that you would pay your premiums after you were born and uh and and so if you had a good birth and everything worked out for you that's that's fine you pay the premiums you never get a payout from your insurance but if things are bad for you at birth well then you do get a payout right now you could say that the social welfare systems of the type they have in let's say sweden or whatever are providing that bad birth insurance in a kind of roundabout way uh, and what they're doing there is uh, correcting a market failure. Um, uh, be careful here. When I say market failure, I mean a failure of a market to exist. I don't mean a failure within a market. There is no market for the reasons I explained to you. There can't be. That is an argument. Now, there's a, so I, and I think that I would want bad birth insurance, uh, but here's a, here's a, it's not a counter argument, but it's a qualification. That argument doesn't entail that it has to be supplied by the state. So you could say, look, yeah, people, that's how people are. People would, would want that insurance. But it doesn't mean the state needs to supply it. You know, before the state got involved in all this stuff, there was, uh, people, got, people looked after the less, the less fortunate in their society. They did it voluntarily. And voluntary mechanisms are better for a variety of reasons because, uh, well, mainly because so much more judgment can be brought to bear. Um, the, the, you know, charity dispensed privately tends to engage much more directly with the individual and their real issues. State charity, so to speak, uh, tends to work on a brute entitlement basis. And a lot of people who don't really, would, wouldn't really qualify for that insurance. You see what I mean? They didn't actually have a bad birth, but they, they nonetheless uh, draw on the system. So, so I, I think I, yeah, I, I would want some kind of a safety net, but I don't know that I want it provided by the state. Sure, just like many other things. I want food, housing, techno uh, housing technology, clothing, friends, mm -hmm. places to shop. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean I want a group of people coercively funding it. I would want voluntarily funded competition that you can disassociate from if they're not actually helping the poor, if they're not yeah. really lifting people up and giving them uh, okay. the, the opportunities. Mutual aid societies, of course, were great uh, places yeah. in uh, fraternities in Britain and uh, the U.S. They also had some sort of camaraderie. But uh, the state is constantly trying to make you dependent on them, turn you against your neighbors. Everyone you know is a racist or a bigot or someone out to screw you. So um, you can only uh, trust us. So, uh, of course, they have every incentive to bash the churches. So they're the only uh, authority in town. And, uh, of course, mutual aid uh, society since the days of Otto von Bismarck, they've been trying to bash just because they – don't uh, want any competing authorities and want you to be uh, dependent on them. So uh, yes, I do like that argument, just like I like a lot of the uh, uh, sympathetic arguments people have, but none of them justify uh, certainly uh, state intervention in what otherwise could be a voluntary exchange. Yeah, I think foreign aid is an interesting case here. I mean, you know, the, 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 there was, in Britain, uh, the previous, uh, our previous government committed to a policy that few countries have, which was to give 0.7% of GDP in foreign aid. This was, this was some kind of UN request that everybody should do that. And Britain signed up to it. The government was signing up to it as a, as a show of being a compassion. They were a conservative party, but they were making a show of being compassionate and caring. And, uh, of course, it's not at all, all compassion comparing to the people who you're taking the money from. But interestingly, it's also not really that compassionate and caring uh, to the people who receive it because there's a lot of evidence that foreign aid administered by governments does more harm than good in the recipient countries. Uh, it's a show of caring, 
without any actual carrying going on. And there's absolutely no need for the government to get involved. Private, many people, me, I know many people who give money to poor Africans, let's say, right? I mean, there's no need for the government to get involved in this. And yet they do. And the beneficiaries almost entirely the people who administer the programs. My wife's African and she, um, she says that you, you get these aid organizations driving around in poor parts of Africa in their luxury cars, staying in the luxury hotels. And you can tell that about 90% of the budget's going on there. It is, yeah. And, uh, you know, basically, if a country has poor institutions, anti-private property, anti-voluntary exchange, what the foreign aid does is sometimes prop up those regimes and make things worse than they otherwise would have been. So it mm -hmm. strengthens the worst parts of that society. Are you familiar with any countries becoming wealthy as a result of foreign aid? I'm just thinking of Britain, America, Singapore, Japan, uh, the places that I would want to live, Luxembourg, did any of them become wealthy because of foreign aid or that kind I of mean, thing? The only, the only case, and it would be tendentious, I think, but the only one you might argue is Germany after World War II. There was a lot of Marshall Fund money going in, but that's a ridiculous thing to say because it was, it was a rich country that had been devastated by war. It wasn't a country that needed to kind of go through that process that you go through. You know, the, all, the, all the countries that got rich went through of, independently doing it. Um, so it, it had everything in place. It had, you know, so I don't think that's a real case, but uh, I mean, most people say the Marshall Program was a success. It involved a transfer of money from the United States to Germany after World War II. But I don't think it in any sense, you can't say, look, that, that's what created modern Germany. You know? uh, modern Germany had already come into being. Or you could look at East Germany versus West Germany and look at the results of uh, those two economic systems. Um, certainly uh, the more uh, free market system had better results. I mean, that talk about a scientific experiment. Well, it's impossible to compare, you know, uh, Britain to the Soviet Union. They're so different. But North Korea, South Korea, Botswana mm -hmm. and Zimbabwe, East Germany and West Germany, Chile and Venezuela, Chile. Yeah, uh, yeah. Th th those are at least, you know, relatively comparable. But um, the uh, pro-science people really uh, the, don't, th don't the, want any uh, scientific experiments. The, uh, you know, those, those Venezuela and North Korea and uh, East Germany, well, they would have worked if only they hadn't been un undermined by capitalist saboteurs of the system. Oh, so they're admitting that economic regulation stops people from prospering. Thank you. They finally admitted it. Yes, uh, it, no. it actually is true. Uh, look, there, there's a guy, I used to work at the Institute of Economic Affairs where I was the dire director of research and a chap who worked in my research team there, Christian Niemitz, who you might want to get on the show, he's very good value. He wrote a book while I was there called um, Socialism, The Failed Idea That Never Dies or something like that. Um, and he goes through, uh, he says, look, in, with every, it's about the Western intellectuals response to left-wing intellectual response to socialist experiments around the world and he says they have an absolutely regular pattern and he shows it in case after case each chapter is devoted to one of these things so soviet union is the first one he says at first they go this is finally here it is the socialist model that we all wanted it's going to be great and they sing its praises then it becomes clear that um it's not working out too well. They start making excuses for it. They look to, they say oh, it's being undermined by American foreign policy or trade barriers or you, you name it, all these kinds of things. Then when it's really completely gone to crap, they say, oh, it was never socialism in the first place. They, they, they disown it completely. And so, you know, you've heard the slogan, socialism, real socialism has never been tried. Um, that that's, they always end up there. Um, and what they can't seem, they often say, they either say it wasn't real socialism, you know, the, the model wasn't exactly right, or it was undermined by these foreigners, or bad people hijacked it, right? Like Stalin, you know, he's a bad guy, Mao's a bad guy. And what they can't seem to explain or uh, face is the fact that these things go wrong, that, that these things always go wrong, is a structural feature of it. It's inherent to it. It's not, it's not like an accident. 
it just so happened that in these seven or eight cases, you know, it went wrong. It has to go wrong. And, and, and it has to go wrong in really nasty ways uh, that involve, you know, horrific oppression of people, often slaughter. And I think the best chapter of Niemitz's book is the first one, when before he gets onto um, each case, he explains why it has to go wrong in the ways that it always does go wrong. And he explains that beautifully. Um, I recommend that chapter of the book. And um, it, Niemitz is very funny at mocking socialists. His, his Twitter account is just an endless mockery of uh, modern day socialists and their stupidity. Well, but it's dangerous stupidity is the problem. It's very dangerous stupidity. Uh, certainly in the case of uh, Venezuela, it's harder with, you know, the North Korea because it was so long ago. With Venezuela, we have a lot of cameras and articles by Noam Chomsky, Sean Penn, Michael Moore, the usual suspects. Mm -hmm. They're like, Fine, look at Hugo Chavez. Look, an example of a group of people uh, finally getting together and uh, coming together for workers' rights. And now they just pretend, and now they just mock us. They're like, oh, you're probably going to bring up Venezuela. And I go, well, it's worth mentioning that. And they go, oh, see, yeah. I knew you'd bring that up. Uh, yeah, you know what? I, I am going to, I am going to, I am going to bring that up. <laughs> this is actually, it's a really bizarre argumentative ploy. So, um, oh, I, actually, I had a girlfriend when I was a PhD student, and I, I was, she was more into the kind of postmodernist type of wibble wobble. And they would make some kind of, she'd make some relativist type comments, or somebody in a talk we were at would make them. And, I would say, well, you know, if it's um, if if Uranus didn't exist, the planet, you know, until it was discovered, and or until it was invented, because of course they believe that scientific facts were invented, not discovered. Um, I said that you had a bit of a problem there, because how are you going to explain that the orbits of the other planets, if, if Uranus wasn't there, because it exerts a gravitational pull on them, and so if you say it didn't exist until that day, you've got an anomaly previously. In fact, of course, that's how they discovered that it existed, because there was an anomaly. And, but anyway, um, the, 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 I would bring up points like that, and they would roll their eyes. Oh, such a predictable, tedious objection. Because, well, yes, it is predictable, because your position's ridiculous, <laughs> and, and basic facts show it to be wrong. But the odd thing was that they, they held it against you that you were invoking basic and very familiar facts to refute their theory. That had somehow was a problem for me, because I'm being boring. <laughs> and, and they've got this really exciting and interesting view. And you know, I would have to, the, the right way to refute their, these positions, when, when they're playing the game amongst themselves, it's very interesting to watch them playing, playing amongst themselves. How do, you, how do you show that one of these guys making a talk is, is wrong? Because you might want to do that. You know, you're a PhD student maybe, and you can get some kudos by showing that the visiting scholars is wrong. But you've got to play by the rules of that world. And, and the rules, in the rules of that world, you would, have to, you would have to say that there was inherent in this view of his some kind of underlying misogyny, perhaps, or something like that, or, or you, you have to excavate some deep, something bad that's lurking in the view that isn't obvious, but I can show you that really it is implicit in there. And that's, that's how they kind of proceed. It's a bizarre, bizarre game. And it's not, as like, far as I can tell, in any way <clears throat> aimed at trying to understand reality. It, it, it's got nothing, it's nothing like um, some ordinary science or honest philosophy. It's an entirely different enterprise, a bizarre game. Um, and, you know, for an outsider to come and sit in on one of these seminars, you'd just have to be utterly bewildered. You would have no idea what was going on. Unbelievable stuff. That's what I like so much about uh, Crimes Against Logic, your book. I want to get into it. Uh, you start off by talking about the importance of knowing rights and duties. Why is it important to know rights and duties? Well, that was in a chapter on the idea that you have a right to your own opinion. This is a common view that you hear, you hear it all the time. And I wanted to explain why that was false. And, but, but, the, it's, but the best way, I think, to understand why when people claim rights, how to test whether they really have the right or not, is to understand that rights entail duties. Now, this, this doesn't mean, oh, um, if you have the right to free speech, you have the duty to use it carefully. I don't, I don't mean that. That's what some people mean. 
No, no, it's something much more fundamental. If I have a right uh, to life, then everybody else has a duty not to kill me. Right? That rights entail corresponding duties, flip side duties, you might say, right? So if, if we do a con, if you and I enter a contract, an employment contract, let's say, suppose you promise to pay me $100 a week if I come and make your bed every day. Well, if I make, then if I do make your bed every day, I have a right to $100 means you have a duty to pay me $100, right? Now, so that's, there's always a corresponding right. So take the right to life. Again, you, you, to see what people mean by a right, you've got to ask what duties does it entail? So for example, the way I said I have a right to life, I said that you have a duty not to kill me. That's a so-called negative interpretation of the right. Um, that, that it doesn't, I'm not suggesting that you have a duty to feed me, right? You don't have to keep me alive, you just have to not kill me. If, if you had a duty to feed me, then my right to life would be a more substantial right. It would be an entitlement in a sense. I have a, a claim against you to, that you provide me with what I need to live. And indeed, many people think that we do have such a right and that the claim is against the state. Um, so what you've always got to ask yourself, when somebody claims that, that they've got a right to this or to that, you go, well, what are the corresponding duties? And you can sum up utterly absurd. The United Nations is endlessly declaring rights. And one of the rights that's declared is that every child has a right to be loved. Well, I think it's nice if children are loved, but who has a duty to love every child? Who, indeed, does, does anyone have a duty to love any child? I mean, is love that kind of thing? Uh, can I love you as a matter of duty? Uh, it, it seems, it's just crazy talk that you have a right to be loved. They, they just mean, we think it would be nice if all children were loved, uh, but th that's not a right. Now, Take the right to your own opinion. People say you have a right to their opinion. What does that mean? Does that mean I have a duty to believe what you say? Um, I mean, I, uh, I have a duty to let you say it, yes, right? But that is a du duty, that, that is a right to express your opinion. That's not a right to, to hold your opinion. If I, if I argue with you, and I prove you wrong, and you are forced by the mere reason to change your opinion, right? So I've, I've, I would have violated your right to hold your opinion, right? Because you know, you've got a right to hold your opinion, and I've taken your opinion away from you through force of reason or counter evidence. And indeed, they appeal to this right. At that point in an argument, you've got the better of them, right? So when you've got the better of something, I have the right to my opinion. Uh, well, uh, by the way, this all sounds like mere silliness, but it's not, you know, the, this idea that we have a right to our, here's a tension. You can't, people can't have both a right to their opinion and a right to express their opinion. Because if you have a right to your opinion and my expressing my opinions would make you lose your opinion, right? Then by my expressing my opinion, I've violated your right to hold your opinion. And you, you do indeed see many people saying that, we shouldn't be allowed to express our opinions when they challenge other people's opinions because other people have got a right to those opinions. They don't say it universally, they just say it on certain topics like, you know, religion and issues of identity and so on. I mean, in Britain now, this isn't yet true, but the, the police, the, one of the police forces in Britain, the Mersey site, it's the police force of Liverpool City, the photos started doing the rounds on Twitter and elsewhere. There they were with a van and they had a big placard up on, built onto the side of the van going up into the air. And it had the, the rainbow flag. You know, the, the, it used to be a gay a, a G, LGBT plus flag. Now they've added a black and brown line to include racial elements as well. So it's, I don't know what it even means. It's got an all purpose flag for, I don't know. You know, you, but we all do know, right? I don't know how to exactly, but we all know. Anyway, they had, that's right. and, and on the side, they'd written, the police had written, um, being offensive is an offense, meaning a criminal offense, right? Um, that's, that's not true in Britain yet, but the police act as if it's true. They, are, for example, there was a group of women, feminists of the, you know, trans exclusionary variety, who had put up posters, again, I think it was in Liverpool, declaring that 
women do not have penises. This is what they wrote. And the police uh, investigated them for a hate crime. And uh, it's so but why, why are they not allowed to say that? Well, because this opinion that some women have penises is not to be challenged. It's, it's considered beyond, you, should, you mustn't challenge that view. If you say very rude things about Islam in Britain, you can get in trouble. Um, do you know about the comedian who got uh, in Scotland who got, uh, got convicted of a hate crime for a joke? I know about the guy in Canada. Not, uh, not Scotland. And there's a guy in Scotland. His name's he's he's a comedian. His name's Count Dankula. Oh and yes, he had his. He made dog. his dog. He taught his yeah. dog to do a Hitler salute um, mm -hmm. whenever he, he said the words "burn the Jews." Um, and this was a joke at the expense of his girlfriend. She'd gone away. And she was a very politically correct type, very woke, and she'd gone away on a holiday. And he trained the dog while it was a, she was away, to just for the sake of appalling her. Right? It it wasn't he. He wasn't targeting, you know, he's, he's, a, pretty, he's a pretty woke guy himself. He, he, you may think it's a tasteless joke, but it was very clearly intended as a joke and a joke at the expense of his girlfriend, not at the expense of Jews. Anyway, he got, he got fined um, he got, and he's got a conviction. He's a criminal, he's a convicted criminal. Um, so yeah, these, I think this idea that people have a right, it you know, started coming along. I, these ideas have been brewing for a long time. You know, they're in my book, and my book was published in 2003 originally, the, the British version. You've got the 2004 American version. And they were so familiar to me, these ideas, that I could write that book up pretty quickly. The, the, the seeds of what we're seeing now were laid, planted long ago. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, you'll, if you read, if you reread my book, you'll see that I, I, a lot of the stuff that's going on now, I'm talking about it back then. It wasn't, the difference back then was, it wasn't a dangerous environment. I, after I wrote that book, the comment editor of the Times, the British Times, not the New York Times, the, the London one, contacted me and said, would you like to contribute comment articles to my, you know, to the Times? And I did for several years. And I wrote stuff that was pretty controversial, I suppose, by modern standards, but it never occurred to me that I was gonna get in trouble for it or cancelled in some way, and I never did. And nobody ever, you know, said anything. And and the Times was happy to keep running my articles because I always made an argument to make it clear. Now, Jesus, now, now I, I pulled an article I'd written the other day. Actually, I, I, I'd written it. I was happy with it. It was going to be published in a leading British magazine, and I showed it to some friends, and they said, "You can't publish that." you'll lose all your contracts. I make my money through commercial writing for companies, by well, the moment I am. And they said, you'll get canceled, you'll lose all your contracts. Because I challenged the uh, identity, the, the culture of identity quotas and all that kind of thing within the corporate world. Um, so it's a complete, although as I said, the ideas have been blowing around for a long, long time but the intolerance around them has, is, is new. That's really exploded in the last five years. That's unbelievable. They're, uh, th they'll always say, you're saying something that could be linked to racism. People talk about racism, then they could believe it. And then this could lead to people's rights being violated while they advocate socialism and statism and regulation, the most violent, murderous Marxist ideologies that have ever existed. I mean, they can't even hear their own words. We, we had Jeremy, you, you, we, our British equivalent of Bernie Sanders is a chap called Jeremy Corbyn. He yeah. was the leader of the Labour Party. He was a real, he was a total socialist, a proper. There's no doubt he was, about He that. was a Hugo Chavez supporter. Oh, huge, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, you name the foreign kind of dictator. Provided they're anti-American, Corbyn likes them. You know, um, <laughs> so, but... So Corbyn is an out and out socialist, an out and out friend of terrible dictators and things. Nobody ever complained about that. I mean, no, the way Corbyn was ultimately kind of run out of town is that they, they trumped up some idea that he was anti-Semitic, uh, which he may be a little bit, I don't know, maybe, I, I don't really think so. He, I think he's just, he's certainly pro-Palestine, but um, to what extent he's anti-Semitic, I don't, I don't know. I, you know, he ple always pleaded that he, he hates racism and I think he really does. But I mean, what was amazing to me is, why are we quibbling about this? 
The man's a communist. He's openly a communist. Do we, do we really have to struggle to work out if he is or isn't anti-Semitic when he's openly a communist? It's like saying, you know, <laughs> you've got a guy in court, you know, he's, he's admitted to murder and rape, and, and you're trying to get him on jaywalking. <laughs> it's crazy. Exactly. Yeah, um, the the, uh, the the whole uh, Palestinian cause certainly. Uh, well, the reason they keep lining up on the Black Lives Matter or LGBTQ uh, after the uh, income inequality arguments don't work out the way they'd like, and they can't divide people based on class, then they'll divide them on race. Why does this government need tons and tons of power? Because of the bourgeoisie and we, the proletariat, are going to have a dictatorship. Why does the U.S. government need tons of power? Because of the terrible racists. Even though if you look at the statistics, black on white crime is much higher than white on black. So, I mean, that's just to say the justification they're using. They do it in foreign policy all the time. They'll just say, we uh, were hated for no reason just because we're free, while completely ignoring the sanctions and bombings that the government has engaged in. They just create an enemy, and that's how the socialists and statists, both left and right wing statists, use it to justify uh, the, their own uh, the, their own concentrations of power. Yeah, they keep changing the question or the problem that needs to be solved by the same thing, which is them having a lot of power over everybody. So it, but, you know, at the moment, I think there are two, there are two, you're, it used to be, you're right, it used to be uh, economic, it used to be capitalism impoverishes the worker. Now, that just clearly was not true. So the 19th century put an end to that. Then there was more kind of egalitarian stuff, we need more equality. There are various reasons why, uh, I mean, you could still run those arguments. I'm actually writing something about that at the moment. I mean, the, the main reason is that if the, if the poor are getting a lot richer, the quality arguments kind of fizzle out. They don't matter much. But, but now you've got, <clears throat> now it's all getting a bit more, at least the, I like those old school socialists more because at least you kind of knew what they were talking about. It was concrete stuff. Workers are poor. They die young. They work in horrible conditions. We want them to be better off. I understand all that. But now things are getting kind of metaphysical. I mean, so what are the problems in American society? Oh, it's, it's whiteness. Well, what the hell is whiteness? I mean, because whiteness, by the way, is not just being a white person. You've got internalized whiteness amongst Asians. You've got all sorts yeah. of stuff going on. You, you, to even understand what the issue is, you've got to do a kind of, you got to do a university course in the, in the crazy metaphysics of it. But, but I think, nonetheless, it, it's, this is how I'd characterize it. You've got, You've got this idea, and it's been pushed by the BLM movement and by the, the trans rights thing, which is that there's a kind of pervasive, they call it structural, a pervasive uh, evil, actually, in society. It's kind, of, it's kind of an evil. And you can't see it necessarily. You may actually be infected by it, but you don't know it. And you need to go and get some counts. You need to get a, someone to do your show, reveal to you your implicit, your internalized bias and all that kind of thing. It's really quasi religious. Um, so you've got that threat. And it needs society to be completely restructured, completely made over from head to toe, which of course requires massive government intervention. It's not going to happen on its own. So now the other, we've also got another thing going on, and they're often the same people in both camps. We have, two existential threats we face. One is the coronavirus. It's going to kill everyone. Again, you can't really see it. It's a bit vague, it's a bit, but you know, it's, it's, it's real. I mean, I do believe it's real. Um, but anyway, it's a, it's a terrible threat. It's not just a threat. It's a terrible threat. And then climate change, of course, which is another terrible threat. And again, conveniently, um, both require, well, it's claimed to require, um, massive interventions in our lives with our liberties and it's always the same people who want who, who jump on these things and you can't help but get the feeling that what they want is the massive intervention and they're just looking for the reason and these things are harder and harder to argue with because they're more and more vague and metaphysical and you're accused of wickedness if you deny the phenomenon right so if you do not if you say America is not as racist as being made out if you point out the statistics that you just did we're not even going to talk to you. Don't even have to listen to you. Um, 
which it's which is ridiculous. It, it, I mean, it's the equivalent of me saying male on female violence is more prevalent than female on male violence. Okay, is that just me? Uh, okay, now what are you going to call me? I, I was right just that. a second ago. <laughs> that, that, that one, but that there's no difference in principle. I'm sorry. Well, again, that, that, no, that no, you're right. But it, you you, you were talking my, about climate. But, uh, the, no, no, the I'm, climate change. I'm finished with the, the point. In, no. But you just remind me in in my book that you've got there. Like, one of the chapters concerns, I think it's called Shut Up. It's, it's just called Shut Up, the chapter. And it concerns ploys that people use not to show that you're wrong, but to shut you up in an argument. And I talk about, um, uh, you know, th there are things, for example, you're allowed to say what you just said, that, you know, men account for most violence in society. Male and female violence is much worse than female and male violence. You're allowed to say that. You're not allowed to say, actually, you know, the police, the police uh, handling of black criminals is, is proportionate in some sense. You know, I, mean, I think American policing is far too violent altogether, um, but that's another matter. But anyway, you're not allowed to say that. Right? You are allowed to say that one, well, you're not allowed to say that one. Um, you, you, changing gender is fine, but changing race is terrible. What, I don't know why is that, I don't know. But we, the funny thing is, although you don't know why uh, one's acceptable and one's not, you do know what you're allowed to say and what you're not. I mean, if you keep up, right, you know the rules, even if the rules are completely arbitrary, you do know them. <clears throat> and it's, it's funny, and, and we know it also, it's got something to do with who's perceived as, as victims. And I think one of the reasons that a lot of feminists are very angry about tra the transgender thing is that is the parallel with race comes in there. So why is it wrong for a white person to pass as black? Because blacks have been victims and are disadvantaged. And it's wrong for you to get the advantages of being recognized as disadvantaged when you weren't really disadvantaged, right? Now, that's why it's no good to go from white to black. Um, and why feminists are angry that men are turning into women is because it's not fair for you to get the advantages of being recognized as a, a woman, which is disadvantaged, when you didn't have the disadvantages of growing up a woman. <laughs> I think that's kind of the logic. Um, that's, that's why, and, and, and so the feminists are screaming at the trans movement shows a hatred, shows a con contempt for women. But, but why does it? Well, because it's not recognizing their, their, gen, their real disadvantages come from being a woman. And I think, for example, I think it's considered okay, sad, but not immoral <clears throat> for a black to try and pass as white. You, that, that used to happen quite a lot. Yeah. And people used to not see the person as being wicked. They saw them as responding to social pressures that they shouldn't have had to. And it was, it was a sad event, but they see someone going from white to black as, as being an immoral thing to do worthy of condemnation. Um, it's very, it's very complicated, but it's all got to do with, uh, it's got to do with the fact that being a victim now is a high status, uh, it's a high status thing. And people are, are um, jealous of their, that status. Um, you know, in New Zealand, where I'm from, Maori, um, you're allowed to, You've got your identity on a census. You've got your it's called your ethnicity of birth and your ethnicity of identity, and many white people now identify as Maori. Um, I, I think there are two reasons there. It's not that they, it's not so much in that case that they want the victim state. It's that they want it. It, it means you're more of a genuine New Zealander. It's a kind of national identification thing. It's an it's an interesting phenomenon. My sister, in fact, uh, was a Maori. By identification, not by, by, not by, by identification. Yeah, uh, it, it definitely. You see the, um, the the socialists issuing people identities and reasons to really be part of something. You want to be part of saving the world? Take the vaccine. You want to be part of saving the world? Fight climate change. Fight the uh, melting of the ozone layer. Uh, we can uh, fight inequality. Fight racism. And instead of actually taking. Uh, Ayn Rand wrote a great essay on racism in 1963 called Racism, and it says 
how it's important to judge people not based on arbitrary characteristics, but mm -hmm. on uh, their character and whether or not they engage in reason, the highest human faculty. I, it's the smartest thing I've ever Sounds heard. Sounds like on. Martin Luther King. <laughs> it, exactly. It's, it, it's more eloquent than anything I've ever heard at all the BLM rallies combined because it's just about creating, creating an oppressor oppressed and using this as a justification to increase state power every single time. Um, you see what you, you're, just, you're just spouting um, white patriarchal ideology here. All these ideas of universalism and individual, individualism and so on, that's just, uh, they've got no claim on any, they've got, on being the truth, they're just, uh, that's just the white patriarchy expressing itself. And the only reason you peddle all those ideas is you benefit from them. Um, don't you and, know? And th the amazing thing is they do that without the sense of irony that they're actually engaged in racism and sexism when they say something like that. They judge people primarily and, based on their race and gender and were the ones holding people accountable by some system of meritocracy, uh, whether they support voluntary exchange, whether they work hard, that's evil. Judging people by their race or skin color, that's a good thing. Everything. What, de what defense? What defense will they have if uh, the white supremacists who are out there um, get the upper hand and start saying, well, in the, there's no rights don't, apply, don't, don't uh, attach to the individual, they attach to the group and you're not in the main group now. So back to the bloody cotton plantation with you. Um, I mean, you know, these ideas, the, the, these ideas from the enlightenment about the dignity of the individual, so they were the foundation of emancipation, the emancipation of women, the emancipation of blacks, the emancipation of homosexuals. These, I, and to see these groups now rejecting this ideology is astounding to me, really astounding to me. Um, it, it, I don't know what, I don't, I don't really get it. I, I have one, I've got one theory. Oh, let me run it by you. I was just having, having it the other night. It's one of these new thoughts and I don't know if it's any good. But I was thinking, you mentioned earlier all these friendly societies, mutual societies and so on, the church, or these social non-governmental but communal organizations right, where people voluntarily came together in certain kinds of association. And even clubs, sports clubs. Now they've all been crowded out, they're all, all dying off, right? Even sports club membership is down in most countries that I that I'm aware of. And Certainly church attendance in most countries is, is way down and friendly societies, things like rotary clubs and all that kind of thing. It's all fading away. And one of the reasons is that those organizations were sources of, um, they were non-governmental sources of support. I mean, the church was the first administrator of, of welfare, really, uh, next, next to the family. And even the family's broken down, right? So what the state, the welfare state crowds out um, private alternatives because you know you're forced to pay the state and then it provides a service for free so how can how can private organizations compete with that even the family has suffered because you know your parents aren't your you've got the state to turn to not it doesn't have to be your parents okay so you got all that <clears throat> but there was another but now so you don't have all these other organizations it's just you your, your little nuclear family maybe and but life lacks a bit of meaning you know these other organizations they used to give you some meaning and some purpose and a sense of engagement with the world and some personal dignity arising out of it and if i wanted to express my values i would do it through those organizations right? what do i do it through now i gotta do it through where do i get my sense of identity and meaning in life it's got to be done through the bloody state um you know you, you but that's it's it doesn't work right because it's too impersonal it's too remote and uh but everybody's lobbying to get the state to embody their values and because the state's become the kind of only vehicle for the expression of these values and it, i wouldn't need to do that if there were more intermediary organizations around and if i didn't naturally turn to the state for all my to solve all my problems so i think that this kind of squabbling so what I'm getting at here is on the right, there's a new illiberal movement. They're called post-liberals. And you know, you saw them associated with Trump, some of them, and they want the state to be 
to not be neutral on matters of value and the good life. They want an activist state that promotes morals and, and social values and so on. I mean, this is abhorrent to us libertarians, but what I'm getting at here is the reason I think there's a growing demand for the state to be like that is because the state's actually killed off all the alternative channels through which we might express those feelings. Um, and we've got, you know, you know, the idea of the atomized individual, just there's truth in it. And it's, it's people are sad and they, they lack meaning in their lives. But the idea, the idea that the state is the answer to that is the opposite of the truth. The state is what's brought about that horrible situation by, by crowding out and thereby killing off. I'll call them intermediary, intermediary social entities. Yeah, certainly. Uh, what I, <laughs> excuse me, mentioned earlier is states really hate competing authorities. They do have to be the monopoly authority because if the state tells me you have to, uh, it's okay for us to regulate these people engaging in voluntary interactions. I might say, uh, whether it's right or wrong, I might say, yeah, but my family always taught me to respect people so long as they're not harming anyone else. My church always taught me A, B, and C. My community, what I learned from my coach at soccer practice is those are just competing authorities. So they will then weigh what they've learned against what the politicians are telling them and the you know powers that be, whatever they are at the time. So that's why they absolutely have to crowd that out. One of the worst examples was in America, in uh, the south part of uh, Texas, Waco, uh, there was a church that uh, they wanted to have a show of force at and uh, things sort of went wrong. They ended up getting so scared because they were gonna defend themselves. They ended up shooting into the church killing a couple kids, stood out there for 51 days, and on day 51 went in and lit the place on fire with CS gas banned by the Geneva Conventions. That is the extent they will go to to make sure we are the ones in charge. Let's be very clear. You cannot resist us. We are calling the shots here. That's what a monopoly on violence really really is. So yeah, they certainly uh, always take those out. And people uh, definitely find identity. You know, here I am just me doing whatever with my life. Maybe I'm a barista. But if I join this group, I'm fighting against the evils of racism. I'm fighting against Donald Trump, Hitler 2.0. This is the guy I'm now uh, part of something that really, really matters. And there's such a low buy-in. I'm Pro, I'm pro-black, anti-white. I'm pro-poor, uh, anti-Wall Street. It's such a low buy-in. That's so easy. It's a lot harder uh, to grasp the principles of Ludwig von Mises's human action. So it's low buy-in. They get the identity, and the state has the symbiotic relationship of it destroying competing authorities or allegiances. <laughs> 